Hi, everyone. Welcome to episode 169 of the Book Cougars, two middle-aged women on the hunt for a good read. I'm Emily. And I'm Chris. Things may sound a little different. I believe last episode, Chris was out of town. This one, I'm out of town. Yeah. So once again, through the magic of technology, we are recording together. Yes, we are. <laughs> Good to see your face. We're, we're doing this through Zoom. Yeah, it's Lovely. nice to see you too. I missed you. Same here. We have a congratulations, right? Yes, we do. We want to congratulate Tracy, who was the winner of the copy of Murder on the Red River that we did as a giveaway through our newsletter. Yeah, thank you to Soho Press, who gave us an extra copy. This is our last read-along of 2022. Wow. Yeah. Another <laughs> fast year. <laughs> yeah. And so congrats, Tracy, on that. We hope you enjoy the book. And we just want to remind listeners that when you subscribe to our newsletter, you're automatically entered to win any of the giveaways we do on the podcast. And to sign up, all you need to do is go to bookcougars.com and look for the little subscribe tab. And if you need help, just reach out. We can also subscribe you if, if you don't want to deal with that. Yeah. And our read along discussion is on December 4th. We still have a couple spots available. We meet over Zoom at seven o'clock PM Eastern time. Send an email to bookcougars at gmail.com if you would like to join the conversation. All right, Emily. So what are you currently reading? I am reading a book called Take What You Need by Idra Novi. This book comes out on March 14th, 2023. I have a lot of ARCs on my Kindle. And since I'm traveling, I traveled via backpack. So I had to keep my real physical copies of books to a limit. I just opened up my Kindle the other day and picked a book. And this one rose to the top. It's told from two different points of view, Jean and Leah. And Jean is Leah's stepmother. And when she and Leah's father divorced, they became estranged. The book is told going back in time and then current day of what happened to their relationship, how it's ebbed and flowed. And I wanted to just read the epigraph because part of why I just was drawn into this book right away is because I read this epigraph and kind of gasped. Every day you have to abandon your past or accept it. And then if you cannot accept it, you become a sculptor. Louise Bourgeois. That's Isn't great. that great? Yes. <laughs> Louise Bourgeois is kind of a character in the book as well. She's a famous artist who I embarrassed to say, never heard of, a French sculptor. She did a lot of work with the feminine form and sexuality. And so the book also is a testament to how we grow and change and handle life through art. I'm really enjoying it. It's been a pleasant surprise. Again, it's called Take What You Need by Idra Novi out March 14th. So let your libraries know about it or put it on pre-order. Nice. Sounds good. Well, I am still making my way through Outlander by Diana Gabaldon. I'm at the 59% mark now. Uh, <laughs> I'm on page 502 out of 850. And I snagged my mom's old mass market paperback copy when I was back in Chicago a couple of weeks ago, I probably bought it for her from Borders back in the day. So it's nice to have it on my e-reader because I was just reading it at bedtime. But now I have a paper copy next to my reading chair. So I have been reading it a little bit more than just before bed. You have been sucked into the Outlander series. <laughs> yeah, I'm sucked in. I don't know if I'll go on after this. Mm. Yeah, we'll see. I'll yeah. withhold my comments until I actually finish the novel. <laughs> <laughs> That's always good. We can get ourselves in trouble, right? <laughs> For sure. <laughs> well, Chris, what did you just read? Well, I, I'm dipping back into the short stories of Constance Fenimore Wilson. I read a collection of short stories of hers that was compiled by Anne Boyd Rue earlier this year and enjoyed them so much. I'm dipping into the Library of America copy that I purchased not too long ago. I'm just going to read them in chronological order as they are laid out in the book. I don't have any type of plan on how I'm going to do it. I'm just keeping the book next to my reading chair, and maybe on the weekends I'll pick it up and read a short story. So the first one I read from this collection is Peter the Parson, 
What I like about her stories is they're written in the late 19th century. I love 19th century fiction, so there's that. But these earlier stories of her first short story collection were stories set in the Midwest around the Great Lakes. She was born in New England but grew up in the Great Lakes area. So this story, Peter the Parson, was set in a frontier town along Lake Superior. And it's about this parson. No one in town likes him. He is not winning over any hearts and minds of the people there. So he's kind of an outcast in this town. And I won't spoil it. I realize in the last episode, I completely gave the spoilers for a Willa Cather short story I talked about. But I was in read-along mode for that. But I just really like the realism of Wilson's stories and how real her characters feel to me. So that was Peter the Parson by Constance Fenimore Wilson. Mm. And are they of a place like Cather's writing with the Great Lakes? I mean, do you get a sense of what the Great Lakes are like? Well, in this story, not so much because it was more about the town and the people in it and this person in particular. If anything, this story reminded me a little bit of Shirley Jackson's The Lottery because it's about that small town people who turn on themselves, so to say. But one of her stories, St. Clair Flats, which was set in the Marsh area around Detroit, and it was set in the 1850s, it was published in the 1870s. I mean, that really captures the landscape. Mm, Yeah. Yeah, and the people and some of the people who live within the Marsh area. So I'm too much of a newbie to her writing to say too much, but I think some of the stories I have read definitely do have a very strong sense of place. All of her stories weren't set in the Great Lakes area. Like she has some that were in the South and in other areas as well. Right. Well, that's a perfect segue for my book, The Seas by Samantha Hunt, which I talked about getting when I was at Longfellow Books in Portland, Maine, because this too is very small town. Also, the narrator is a bit of an outcast in her small town. She's a woman whose father was a sailor and walked into the sea eight years prior to when this book is taking place. And they never found his body, but of course, presumed dead. But she and her mother are kind of stuck sitting vigil over him and wondering and and kind of waiting, even though, of course, realistically, he's no longer alive. But he had told her she had grown up with stories that she was a mermaid Mm -hmm. who was living on land. Talking about small towns, I thought I would start by just reading the very beginning part of the book. The highway only goes south from here. That's how far north we live. There aren't many roads out of town, which explains why so few people ever leave. Things that are unfamiliar are a long way off, and there is no direct route to these things. Rather, it's a street to a street, to a road across a causeway, to a road across a bridge, to a road to another road before you reach the highway. If you were to try to leave, people who have known you since the day you were born would recognize your car and see you leaving. They would wonder where you were going and they would wave with two fingers off the steering wheel. A wave that might seem like a stop sign or a warning to someone trying to forget this very small town. It would be much easier to stay. Wow. (laughs) Small towns. (laughs) I mean, there's a complacency you can get in a small town, but also you can be judged to be a certain person and it's very hard to let go of that identity or just to have other people let go of that identity, I guess is the better way to say it. So she is sitting on the beach one day, the narrator of the book, and meets a man, Jude, who's an Iraqi war veteran. He's 13 years older than her. She falls madly in love with him. That love is not returned. So she pines for him throughout the book, but she also has this internal dialogue that's going on where she's very confused about who she is. As I was reading it, I felt like I was reading through gauze, if that makes any sense. It's very ethereal writing, Mm -hmm. I think. It's a little bit creepy. It's sad. It's mythological with that mermaid theme. There's an event that I don't want to spoil that lands her in jail. And that's probably the last I'm going to say about the book. It was a national book award for writers under 35. I think back in 2004, 2005, it was published in 2004. So she 
got a lot of praise for this book. Again, it's called The Seas by Samantha Hunt. Wow. So you felt like you were reading through gauze. Was it a little bit like being underwater too? That would be a good way to say it. The epigraph implies that it's a story within a story. So she starts to feel like an unreliable narrator. So you're not sure. I mean, she thinks she's a mermaid. So that gives you some indication, right. you know. <laughs> <laughs> it was very interesting. And her writing is really good. I read it on my flight out here. It's a pretty small little book. I really enjoyed it. Well, I had a DNF. I did not finish. And it was called The Archivist by Rex Pickett. And it was a sample that I downloaded. You know how you can do that? You can download a preview onto your Kindle. That's 10% of the book. I barely made it through the 10%. And I was hoping for the book to get better. I was tantalized by the plot. So it's a young woman who's a project archivist who's going to a new job at a university archive to work on the papers of this famous writer who is shortlisted. Is it for the Pulitzer or the Nobel? I don't remember, but one of the big literary awards. And the person who held the job before her, another young woman archivist, was found drowned on the seaside. So it's this mystery, and it sounded just so good to me, but I just couldn't get into the writing. It was very overwritten, overdescriptive, a lot of $25 words when a 10 cent word could have done the same. (laughs) So that just got a little too much for me. And then when I looked at the actual book and saw that it was 700 pages long, I thought, yeah, no, I can't do this. Mm -hmm. So, and I have to say, I don't think he is a very good writer of women characters. She didn't seem believable as a woman. Mm. It always makes me wonder why not just write it as a man? Like, why couldn't it have been a male character? Why did you need to try to make a female character? But I'm not saying men can't write female characters well, but maybe could have tried that. Well, I have a feeling it's because the male writer who is the big wig, who's going to be getting this really big award soon, he or his wife are probably the murderer of the prior archivist. I'm sure there's something in his papers that that woman found and somebody murdered her to cover it up or who knows. I'm not sure. So I'm only mentioning the book because I'm hoping one of our listeners has read the book and can tell me more about it. If it is worth (laughs) my time to, to pick it up. She just wants to know the ending. (laughs) (laughs) So the chase. Yeah. Right. What happens on page 699. (laughs) So that was the archivist by Rex Pickett. Sorry, Mr. Pickett couldn't do it. (laughs) I, on the other hand, finished a book I loved called On Writing, A Memoir of the Craft by Stephen King. I listened to this on audiobook. Stephen King narrates it. I also happened to get the 20th anniversary edition, and there's bonus content at the end. Two different things. One was his son, Owen King, reading an essay he wrote for The New Yorker called recording audiobooks for my dad, Stephen King, which was really good. And he talks about recording audiobooks for his dad starting at the age of 10, (laughs) just for his dad to listen to, which I thought was great. When I heard the title of the essay, I thought, does Owen King do the narration for Stephen King's novels? You know, I was a little confused, but it was a really great piece, which you can find on the New Yorker website online. I'll put a link in the show notes. And then there was a recorded conversation with Stephen King and his son, Joe Hill, a live event that had a lot of people there. So that was really fun. They were very irreverent. Lots of cuss words were thrown. It was fun to hear Stephen King interviewed by someone who obviously knows him well. (laughs) Right. Yeah. (laughs) It's part memoir and part classroom learning for writers. It was really interesting. And it starts in his early years as a writer. And he also talks about his childhood, talks about his marriage and fatherhood, addiction, then the coming success of his writing and his career. And then the accident that took place where he was hit by a car as he was walking on the side of the road in Maine. And then the recovery from that. And he had actually been halfway through writing this memoir when that accident occurred. So he also recounts 
his wife, Tabitha, helping him get back into his writing chair, literally, and get back at it. You know, I've read some reviews of it, too, and I don't feel like anyone talks about the fact that it's also a love story. He and his wife, oh my God goodness, what a relationship they have. Yeah. Isn't it beautiful? I love it so much. When you mentioned that you were listening to this, I decided to listen to it as well. Because, you know, I had read the book before, but I love his narration of this. Speaking of cuss words, I think he uses them quite appropriately and wonderfully. But yeah, his love affair with Tabby, she's his reader, like she's the person he writes for. I just love the way he describes their relationships. I'm just at the point where they they were driving from a basketball game. They were in North Carolina for a basketball game. And so she was reading his latest story in the car the next day. He's driving and he keeps looking over and she's like, would you knock it off and just pay attention to driving? You're going to kill us. <laughs> um, <laughs> but writers are needy, especially between their first draft and their second draft when their main reader is reading the piece, he's like, so I, I didn't look at her anymore. But then like five minutes later, she, she laughed at something and I felt much better. <laughs> yes. Right. Just lovely that part. And then in that bonus material I was talking about when Joe Hill tells a story where one of his editors wants him to make a change in his book. And he's like, mm -mm, I'm not going to do it. And then his mom reads it and she's like, Joe, you got to change this. And he was like, okay. Oh, wait, his mom? Oh, you meant Joe Hill's yeah. mom. Okay. Yeah, Which Joe is Hill's Tabby, yeah. who yeah. is, who is Stephen, Stephen King's wife, right. right? And so it was like, whatever mom says goes. But I, I didn't agree with it when my editor said it, you know, and I thought that was such a cute story. Yeah. So, and then the other part of the book, it's really for aspiring writers. I mean, boy, does he dish out a lot of information on craft. That part I actually felt was hard to listen to, and I'm definitely going to get a physical copy and just read it and maybe read it while listening to him narrate just so it goes into my head a little bit more and I can see the words. Yeah, you know? it's a great idea. Yeah, I mean, and yeah. for fans of his early work in the stories he tells, you just see like, wow, that was the seed of some of those early stories that he told. It's fascinating. Right. It's really good, including Carrie, right? He starts by telling the story of writing his first novel. Right. Well, the first novel that got published, I should say. Yeah, and his wife, Tabitha, is the one who took the manuscript out of the garbage can because he was right. he got frustrated with it. And while he was gone, she took it out and read it. And she was like, you need to work on this. This is good. And uh -huh. thank God she did because, I mean, who knows? I'm sure he would have kept writing because he was, but his whole career could have taken a different path for sure. Yeah, absolutely. So again, it's called On Writing, A Memoir of the Craft by Stephen King. I listened to it on audiobook and he narrates. Well, I did finish Sweet Thursday by John Steinbeck, which was half of the pick of the Vintage Book Club for our meeting earlier this month. We read Cannery Row and then Sweet Thursday is the companion book to Cannery Row. And we decided to read them both because they're both short. And prior to this, we had read... East of Eden, which was huge. And we thought, oh, two books. We could totally handle that. I don't think we'll do two books again because I think it's really challenging to talk about two books in an hour meeting. I was really interested in what the group members had to say about Sweet Thursday. Which book were they going to like more than the other? And Cannery Row definitely stood out as everyone's favorite. And in fact, Robin, one of the members, she's like, you know, when I started reading Sweet Thursday. She's like, it pissed me off. She's like, I was getting really angry at the book because she loved Cannery Row so much and she didn't want things to change and she didn't like the way he was handling certain things because Cannery Row came out in 45, I think, and Sweet Thursday in 54. And what I didn't know, I, I found this out after reading it and doing a little research, Steinbeck's friend, Ed Ricketts, who Doc was based on, the character Doc, he actually died in 1948 in a car accident and Steinbeck was just devastated. And Sweet Thursday is such a beautiful tribute to his friend. So yeah, I, I read that too. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I enjoyed Sweet Thursday, but I can see why Cannery Row is the better book. See, that's funny. I liked both, but I thought the reading of Sweet Thursday was a little easier for me. I don't know why. Me too. And I've been thinking a lot about that. And I think it's because it was a bit more of a conventional love story. 
Mm. Susie and Doc. So I yeah. thought that gave it more of a center, at least for me. Whereas Cannery Row was much more episodic. Yeah, yeah, that's right. It felt more like essays and little random things that he put in there. Yeah, Sweet Thursday felt more like a novel to me. You're probably right. It just read a little easier. Yeah. Yeah, yes, I'm happy to have read both of them. And we had a good conversation. Right. I missed it. I was so sorry to miss it. But I had a week that got a little overwhelming. <laughs> yeah, I know how that goes. But um, we missed you and we hope to see you next time. Yeah. Oh, and I should say, we meet at the Wood, the Wood Memorial Library Museum. And during the conversation, Jessica, who is their events person, is one of the hats that she wears. She came in to tell us that they were actually selling off and giving away all of their fiction because they are no longer going to carry fiction. They are going to be focusing on being a research library and museum, more so than a lending library particularly a fiction anyway, because there is already a lending library in town. But I know they recently hired an archivist and they do have some really fantastic collections there. So things are changing. I think they were built in 1927. So they're going to be having their 103th anniversary soon. So they're doing lots of improvements on the building as well as rethinking and, you know, reshaping their collections. So it'll be interesting to watch that process. Ooh, it sounds dangerous to go there, though. So are they selling the fiction for like $2 a book or something like that? I think it was a dollar. But when we were there, she said they're free. Because I think they're, <laughs> you know, they only had like yeah. one wall left for the most part. Gotcha. She's like, take whatever you want. Here's some tote bags if you need to fill up the bags, <laughs> you know. She was really... Take two bags. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> so That's I think great. we all left with a couple treats um, in our nice. tote bags. So that was nice. But yeah, I do look forward to seeing how they progress. Yeah. Well, I finished the short novel Shame by Annie Erno. She's the 2022 Nobel Prize winner in literature. I had never heard of her Same. when she won. Well, I'm glad to hear that because I always feel embarrassed when that happens. But I know there's a lot of writers in the world. This book, Shame, was published in 1998. And it's my book club pick for first quarter next year of 2023, but I thought I'd get a jump on it. And the first sentence of this book is, my father tried to kill my mother one Sunday in June, comma, in the early afternoon. Wow. She was 12 at the time. So this is actually a memoir. I think I might have said it was a short novel. I'm sorry. It's a memoir. It does read very much like a novel. I think she has written some fiction, but she is mostly known for her memoir writing. Or if not just that, but her fiction is very autobiographical, I think, as well. The town in this novel is referred to as Y. She never names her small town that she grew up in. And the book is only... I don't have it with me, but I think it was like 112 pages or 120 pages, very spare writing. So she's 12 and she walks into the scene where her father is strangling her mother. And it's not as if she breaks it up or anything. Their fight dissipates. He lets go of her and they go about their merry way. But this event has just burned itself in her memory and it affects her for the rest of her life. And that's what she's writing about in this book. It's really well written. I was amazed by it. And I felt like it really gave me some insight into childhood trauma that we're learning to understand. The New York Times review of this back in 98 said, wonderment at the silently watching child that never really leaves us. And I thought, wow, that's so true. Because that's what you're doing as you're reading this. You're realizing that we all have these experiences in childhood that are so big. I think when you experience something as a child, you know, you don't have as many life experiences and you don't understand them. And then sometimes the adults in your life who are experiencing them as an adult don't know how to talk to you as a child. Right. right? Or they, yeah, they don't even think about how it is different for a child who doesn't have context to understand right. something and how much scarier it can be. Seeing somebody trying to choke another person is scary, no matter what your age, but yes. actually as a child and it's your parents. 
Yeah, as adults, I would think maybe we would understand anger or things like that. Right. I mean, I was so lucky. I feel like when my kids were growing up, I had a friend that was a child psychologist. And every once in a while, I would just get on the bat phone. <laughs> like, you know, I've got this thing going on. I need to talk to my kid about what do you recommend? And I was always shocked at how simple she could make it because whatever the situation was felt so complex to me. Right. You know? Mm hmm. Yeah. So again, it's about her experience of this event in her parents' life and in her life and how it was never spoken of again and the searing impact that had on her. I loved it. As an aside, I was talking to someone recently about autism and they were saying that they think some of the cause of autism could be childhood trauma that kids don't deal with. And sometimes someone will experience a trauma and become mute by choice, a traumatic choice, and that a form of autism could develop after a traumatic experience. Mm. I don't know if there's any scientific research on that, but I was kind of fascinated by that idea. And then I happened to read this novel the week later and I thought, oh, that's really interesting. Well, when you think about what's on TV, I mean, even during October, you know, when you first turn on, say, Netflix, there are so many movie covers that are just filled with violence and blood and torture And I always feel like, really, like, why do they have to show that? I mean, it's one thing if you're going for it, but that's traumatizing to see that type of imagery. I do not like it. Yeah, Yeah. I 100% agree with you. And I try to keep images like that away from my vision. Yeah. And it can be really hard when you don't Mm -hmm. have control over what's on those screens. Yeah. And we're middle aged and we feel that way. So, right. Yeah. A little, (laughs) yeah. 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 Well, I'm yeah. glad you read her because I was so curious. I hadn't heard of her either. And I was wondering what her writing was like. So I'm I'm glad that you had this one to share with us. Yeah, I'm definitely going to read another one. There was another one that we were talking about. I can't remember the title right now, but it takes on the subject of abortion. I think it's a novel, but it is, again, autobiographical where she had an abortion when she was a young woman. So that's another one that's on my list that we talked about reading, but we ended up choosing Shame. So did you have any Biblio adventures? You know what? I did, and we did. We forgot to mention... From our last Biblio adventure in the last episode, when we went up to Edith Wharton's home, The Mount, we also stopped at the Lennox Library on the way out of town because it's this gorgeous old building and, you know, we hit the brakes. So I looked up a little bit about the library. It's a gorgeous old brick building. It's a Greek revival. It was built between 1815 and 16 as the county courthouse. And it served in that capacity until 1868 when the county seat moved to a different town. But then in 1871, a woman, Mrs. Adeline Shermer Horn, who was a wealthy summer resident, because this was a community of people coming for the summer to get out of the city, she purchased the building specifically for it to become a public library and a reading room that would be free to all the inhabitants of Lenox. There was a library association in town that was founded in 1856. And so I guess after the renovation, they moved into the space in 1874. And it's been a library ever since. Yeah, it was beautiful space. And we were there. I don't know. It was just dark. It was not there. Yeah. Yeah. And it was really well lit and people were really using the space. They had evening hours, which I always appreciate a library that has good evening hours. Yeah. Yeah. It was really nice to see so much activity in there. And it's such a big library. It's one of those buildings where there's been additions over the decades. So you kind of feel like, oh, there's more. Oh, there's more. Right. Oh, we can go downstairs. We can go upstairs. So we right. explored the whole building and it was lovely. It was really fun. And yep. we, we ran into a librarian working in one of the rooms. We walked in and there was this wonderful dome this painted dome. And Emily's like, oh, I want to work here. And we heard a voice say, do you want to work here or like work in here? I forget what exactly (laughs) she said. And so we went around and we saw her working at a temporary station. And she told us that Edith Wharton had actually been a trustee of the library, right? which is cool to hear about. 
Yeah. And this dome was beautifully painted and there was some scaffolding in it. They were just about to start a huge project to do some repair work. Yeah. So it's always good to see that library has funding to maintain its physical presence. Yeah. And you know, what was cool too, when I was reading about the library in the 1890s, it also became the home or housed the town doctor and the first telephone switchboard and fire alarm system. And then it even had a jail at one point and the offices of the Lenox National Bank were also wow. in there. And the librarian had told us when you first walk in, they had a little historic display. And then to the left, you walk into the library proper and they had a Friends of the Library book sale in this little alcove type area. The librarian that we ran into upstairs had said, you know, if you look at that, you can see the hinges from the big bank vault door. So on the way out, we looked at those and totally yeah, spotted them. It was really cool. Yeah. And that was a good Friends of the Library sale, I should add, too. I was tempted, but didn't. You I? <laughs> <laughs> I went on a great virtual Biblio adventure, thanks to Aunt Ellen, who let me know about this one. It was through the San Francisco Public Library. Aunt Ellen was attending it in person, which I was completely envious of. But it was their one book, one read for the library system. And it was the book, This is Ear Hustle, Unflinching Stories of Everyday Prison Life by Nigel Poor and Erlon Woods. And they're the team that have brought together that podcast called Ear Hustle. Have you heard of it? I had not. Okay. It's a very well thought of podcast that's been going on for quite some time. And I'm going to just read something about it because I feel like they'll tell it better than I will. In 2018, Ear Hustle was launched in the basement media lab of California's San Quentin State Prison as the first podcast created and produced entirely within prison. It has since been globally lauded for the rare access and perspective it contributes to the conversation about incarceration. So at the time, Nigel, who's a visual artist, was going into the prison and Erlon Woods was a prisoner. And due to the success of this podcast and the work that he has done, Erlon has done around understanding incarceration and prison reform and things like that, he actually was able to get early release from prison. And he and Nigel are still doing a lot of great work. This book is a testament to that, telling stories about prison life. The event was moderated by Piper Kiernan, who is the author of Orange is the New Black. There is a video available. It was a really great Q&A that they did. The other thing is that Nigel and Erlon, when they got this honor of being the one book, one read, they wanted to go visit all 27 branches of the San Francisco Public Library, and they did. Cool. And they started the event with a video that they had put together. As Erlon said, it's amazing what you can do with an iPhone these days. So they had interviewed various librarians. There's a cute little segment on what a library voice is and kind of dispelling the myth about having to use a library voice when you're inside the public library. So they started the event with that, and then it became just a conversation between the three of them. Again, it's called This is Ear Hustle, Unflinching Stories of Everyday Prison Life, and I will put a link in the show notes to the video so you can watch it if you're interested. Oh, very cool. Uh, Ellen sent us a nice poster, too, the poster for the One City, One Book that they autographed for us. Yes. Thank you, Aunt Ellen. It is sitting in a place of honor in Book Cougar's headquarters now. We'll post a picture of it on social media. Yeah, for sure. Well, I had a walk around New Haven just the other day. I had some books from the Institute Library that I had to return. So I just dropped them in the Dropbox because they're finally getting some much needed repair work done on their walls where there had been some water damage. So I didn't get to go in and browse. So I dropped those off. And then I walked over to Gray Matter Books and had a big browse there and was just planning on browsing. But of course, I left with a stack of books. <laughs> it's such a good bookstore. It's a used bookstore. It is. So nice. And it's really well curated. They have a great literature section. I found a copy of A Backward Glance by Edith Wharton. Look forward to reading mm -hmm. that. That's her autobiography. And then also a collection of her critical essays that she had written 
and some other books as well. That was nice. fun. And then I also walked across the street and browsed at Barnes and Noble a little bit. So that was a really what nice day. Yeah. It's getting cold here and I wasn't really dressed properly. So I walked really fast and um, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, what's kind of nice about New Haven is there's four bookstores within a three block radius. Mm -hmm. They're not that far apart. So yeah. You can, Atticus. You is can walk close. fast. Yeah. Yeah. Atticus. And then that other used bookstore whose name I can never remember. I know. I can't either. Which is terrible. And then Gray Matter and then Barnes and Noble. Mm -hmm. So yeah, you can go coatless and get through four bookstores pretty easily. Right. Yeah, <laughs> you can. So I visited a bookstore on my way up the mountain from Denver to Carbondale. I'd heard about this bookstore. It's called The Bookworm of Edwards, Colorado. Unfortunately, I was so hungry by the time I got there, I completely forgot to take pictures <laughs> because I was going to do a post on social media. Sorry, everybody. This bookstore was founded in 1996, and it started as a van traveling from coffee shop to coffee shop selling new books. That's great. I just love that story. And then they ended up in a brick and mortar space and now they've moved for the second time but it's a beautiful much bigger space and they have a fantastic cafe part of why i wanted to stop by is i was so curious they have a soup subscription so you can subscribe and get a quart of soup and eight rolls and something else once a week That's... so of course i wanted to try their soup and it was delicious i got a very warm beef and barley soup and a salad and it was cold, but I wanted to eat outside because I'd been inside, you know, all day traveling and they forgot to dress the salad. So I walked back inside to get the dressing. And when I came out, a bird was pecking at my salad. <laughs> <laughs> I couldn't believe it. And I was like, should I not eat it now? And of course I said, no, of course I'm going to eat it. I'm hungry. <laughs> so I ate my salad. But it was very funny. It's a lovely store. They had a cool display, Chris, by the cash register of that, you know, that blind date with a book where they write on it, kind of give you hints. But I thought it was neat because it was $3 or pay what you can. That's nice. Which I thought was super cool. And a lot of them were for kids, you know, YA. So I thought that was really nice. So it was a great stop and it was exactly halfway. So I got to stretch my legs and do a browse, get something to eat meet a bird and move <laughs> <That's> on. <awesome. laughs> Do you know what kind of bird it was by any chance? Yes. Out here, they have these magpies that are these huge black and white birds. You know, I had been eating my soup and I saw the magpie sitting on the railing and I don't know why it didn't occur to me that it might go for my salad if I walked away <laughs> and turned my back. <laughs> That's great. And I don't think you told the listeners where you are. If you want to oh, say where you are anyway. Yeah, I should have said that. So I am calling in today with Chris from Carbondale, Colorado, high up at elevation. So I've been here enough days to get my breath back. That's good. <laughs> <laughs> so do you have any upcoming jaunts, Chris? Well, I have one really big one on the books that involves both of us. We are, woo, woo. <laughs> yes, we just got our tickets for... A screening, actually, of a popra. So I'm not really sure what a popra is, but it's Emily and Sue with the composer Dana Kaufman. And this is a popra, opera, a popular opera, I'm not sure, that was actually filmed in Emily Dickinson's bedroom, her actual room at her house in Amherst. And the opera uses her and Sue's letters to one another and also some of Dickinson's poetry. Some of the themes that it explores are isolation, queerness, and forbidden love. So this film just premiered earlier in November, and we're going to be going to the screening at Amherst College in the evening of November 30th. And prior to that, we also got tickets to Emily Dickinson's house and museum. It was recently renovated, so we haven't been there since the renovation. They now do timed tours where you can pre-purchase the tickets. They can't guarantee walk-ins at this point, any or now with their new system. So we have tickets for a tour of the house earlier that day. 
Oh, it's going to be an all things Emily Dickinson day. I can't wait. Yeah. That's going to be a lot of fun. I'm so looking forward to it. And so that's November 30th, everyone. We'll put links in the show notes to these things. And if you're in the area, Amherst, Massachusetts, you know, uh, grab a ticket and come join us. It'd be so much fun to, to meet folks up there. Yeah, we would love that. I can't wait. That's yeah. going to be a good day. Totally. Yeah. So what about you? Do you have anything else on your calendar? I don't. No. I mean, I'm hoping to maybe hit some other bookstores while I'm here, maybe some libraries, but nothing on the books. Nice. Well, good. Have a lovely visit out there. Just doing whatever yeah. happens every day. Yes. <laughs> There's, we don't, the last time I was here, I was here for their wedding. So it's kind of been nice to just have quiet time together. Mm -hmm. It's cold and we're just in the fire and enjoying each other's company. Lovely. Do you have any upcoming reads, Chris? I do. You know, the other day... I have no idea why this popped into my head, but I thought I'd like to reread Deliverance by James Dickey. I have no idea like what prompted that because I read the novel some years ago and I really liked it. It was really surprising because it obviously gave you so much more context and more levels than the movie did that was so popular with, with Burt Reynolds back in the day. So when I was at Grey Matter the other day, wouldn't you know, they had this lovely box edition of deliverance on the shelf and I was like no way oh, no. I was like you know I had it was one of those synchronicities right I thought is yes. this the reason that I'm standing here today is because this copy of deliverance is here so I had to buy it so I plan on reading that sometime soon but right now it's about a month before the end of the semester so I'm in crunch mode with school projects what? Yeah. So that stack is just building, but you're going to be so ready. Oh yeah. <laughs> I think I'm going to sleep for two days solid and then I'm going to do nothing but read for pleasure. <laughs> well, I'm going to start Inciting Joy, which is a book of essays by Ross Gay. His book, The Book of Delights, got a lot of high praise, I think last year or the year before. He's a poet. I always love things written by poets. We've entered the dark season where we live, where it's dark at 415. And I can sometimes have some of that seasonal affect stuff going on. I light my candles at four o'clock. I try to brighten up the house. But I thought, what a wonderful thing to have this book. It's got a beautiful little cover. And it's really about doing nice things for each other and being in each other's life and bringing happiness and gratitude. I don't even know if happiness is the right word. Just being in touch with your gratitude and caring for each other, which seems like a really good message after the pandemic year we've been through and everything. So yeah. I'm going to keep that kind of on my coffee table and just dip in and out of the essays. So we have a list of out nows. These are books that we've talked about on the podcast where we got to read an early edition, but we want to remind you that they're now published. The first one is... A Ghost of Caribou by Alice Henderson. Yeah, that's the third book in the Alex Carter series. We interviewed Alice Henderson about the first two books in the series, and the third one is out now. Yeah, highly recommend that. We both love this series. A few are into the great outdoors and wild animals, and you enjoy a good mystery thriller, definitely seek out that series. The other book is Dark Rivers to Cross by Lynn Reeves. I talked about that on episode 167. She's out on book tour now, and she just had an event last night with Lou Ann Rice. Cool. That if I were in town, I would have definitely gone to. It was at the Savoy. So I was really sad about that, but happy for them. Yeah, that's <laughs> awesome. And the Savoy, that's the uh, bookstore in Westerly, Rhode Island, which is not too far from us. Right. And then the other book that's out now is Fatty, Fatty, Boom, Boom. By Rabia Chaudhry. This is a memoir about growing up in the United States in a Pakistani family. And Fatty Fatty Boom Boom was actually a nickname that her family had for her as she struggled with her weight and the family ate a lot of fast food, things like that. I thought I was going to start that last weekend and then my time got away from me. So I'm going to start that one when I get home. Great. Well, coming up next... We have a fabulous conversation, at least we think it is, with our <laughs> mystery man, John Valeri, and author Marsha Clark. Yeah, she was talking to us about lots of things, but mostly her newest release, The Fall Girl. And we were talking to her about the audiobook. 
because she narrated the audiobook with her friend, Kathy Lepard. And Kathy is one of her writing partners. And so we wanted to talk to Marsha about her experience narrating the audiobook. But then, of course, we ended up talking to her about a lot of other things as well. Right. Yeah. <laughs> and we we had kind of done the audiobook as a read along with John, which right. was fun, or a listen along, which is something we had not done before. So that was fun. Right. It was really fun. And I enjoyed the book. It was a page turner for me. And it is a standalone. So I felt like it was also a nice way to start experiencing Marsha Clark's writing because she has written a memoir and I think maybe one other work of nonfiction. But oh, nonfiction, um, yeah. Is it, it, I don't is it know. considered a memoir, the one she wrote about the Yeah, trial? the one about the trial. Okay. I, yeah, and then she does have fiction series. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, I've read yeah. a couple of those. She just really writes really great women characters. She does. Yep. Yeah. yeah. So check out her fiction, the latest one being The Fall Girl. So enjoy our conversation. We're here today with John Valeri and Marsha Clark. I'm going to introduce John, and then John's going to do an intro uh, for Marsha. Longtime listeners already know our mystery man, John Valeri, but for those of you tuning in for the first time, John is a creative writer and literary critic. His reviews, features, and author profiles have appeared in places like Crime Reads, Mystery Scene Magazine, The National Book Review, and The Strand Magazine. In 2020, John launched Central Booking on YouTube, where he interviews authors of all genres. Chris Sigorski of Ellery Queen Mystery Magazine wrote that Central Booking is a must-watch experience. You can always count on John to ask the questions you want to know the answers to, and a few you never even thought to wonder about. Welcome, John. Hello, Book Cougars. Marsha, thank you for having me back. Of course. So excited to be here. So, you know, I feel like this has all come full circle because when you first started having me on as your mystery man and asking for recommendations, I would, of course, always recommend Marsha Clark's books. And it sort of got to the point where it would start with like, okay, John, welcome back. Do you have anything to recommend other than Marsha <laughs> Clark's books? So now that we have Marsha Clark here in the hot seat, like I feel like all of that's been maybe reconciled. <laughs> But there's another book to recommend by Marsha Clark. It's The Fall Girl. Thinking about introducing Marsha Clark, I mean, what can I say? You all know her. You've seen her. You probably grew up with her. I grew up with her. And so I think my introduction is going to be a little bit more personal and anecdotal. And if you want the official biography, you know, you can find that pretty much anywhere. Um, I'm going to hold up a picture. And I know that people who are listening to this as a true podcast may not be able to see it because it's mostly voice. But I'm taking you back in time. I think oh this God. is a Marcia Clark headshot circa 1996, maybe, because yeah. I was that person who would write a fan letter to my favorite lawyer. Like, <laughs> you know, so as a 12 or 13 year old kid, like most people were looking up to athletes or actresses or philanthropists or whatever it might be, but. I found myself very much looking up to Marsha Clark. I think everybody knows her from the trial, and that's pretty much all I'm going to say about that. I think the trial covers it, but it was a very prolonged and protracted spectacle. And I always felt that Marsha was sort of the moral compass of that trial and really tried to keep the focus, you know, on the evidence where it should have been when it became about so many other things. And I really felt like if I ever met Marsha Clark, we might get along. Like, I feel like we might have some kind of kinship and that sounds ridiculous and crazy. And I never actually thought that I would meet Marsha Clark, know Marsha Clark, consider her my friend. And then fast forward the story many, many years, or I'll be talking all night. We get to 2011, 11 years ago now, crazy. And Marsha Clark, the prosecutor is now Marsha Clark, the writer after stints in radio, television. She kind of did it all. But her first crime novel, Guilt by Association, came out. And of course, I was all over that. And so it's like, hey, publicist, Sabrina Callahan, love you forever. Can we do an interview? Can we do something? And so we did. And then Marsha Clark in California and John Valeri in Connecticut somehow met because the publisher sent Marsha to launch her book in Connecticut, of all places, 
you had three events in Connecticut. And I remember coming up to you on the first night and saying, look, I just, I have to tell you, don't be afraid. Like you're going to see me <laughs> for all three nights. I might be a little crazy, but it's, you know, it's like benignly crazy. So please don't feel the need to take out a restraining order on me. And I remember what you said to me, Marsha Clark. You looked at me and you said, I would never do that. We all know that just makes people try harder. And I knew <laughs> that moment that we were going to be, if not friends, at least friendly. And now here we are many years later. <laughs> Is that one for the introduction? <laughs> but let me just say, you know, the one thing that I think people don't know about Marsha is what a hard worker she is. You know, to me, you were sort of the definition of transformation. You took an event in your life that was very, very bad and you made some good out of it. And you said, you know, I did this thing. It's not working for me anymore. I'm going to do something else and I'm going to do something else and I'm going to do something else. And now you literally do all of them. Marsha still practices appellate law. Uh, she's done television, podcasting. This is her ninth novel, but first standalone. Um, and just a few weeks ago, when I thought I'd learned everything I could possibly learn from Marsha Clark, she hit me with another little nugget of wisdom that really resonated. You know, I was asking for advice, you know, something that she had learned that she would pass on to other people. And she said, you know, reconsider what you think is a door when it comes to a writing life or a creative life. Maybe you think that you're meant to do one thing, but if you're doing something similar, you know, walk through that door, the paths are probably going to run into one another. So you want to write books, okay, but maybe you're writing for television. Maybe you're writing an essay. All of that is leading you on the path if you're open enough, you know, to embrace that. And I thought, well, that speaks to me. Marsha Clark still, you know, speaks to me all these years later. I'm going to shut up now because that was a lot, but... <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, Marsha Clark. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we talked about, the, and this is something that, you know, actually, I, as it just happened, when you asked me that question, which, by the way, I didn't know you were going to ask me, John. <laughs> <laughs> by the way, guys, we've been friends for a really long time. We communicate every day, sometimes multiple times a day. So if it seems a little bit familiar, that's because we are. So <laughs> we were. he asked me during this interview, um, what piece of advice? And I just happened to be thinking about the ways in which we decide we want to do X or Y or Z. I want to write a book, or I want to write a book that is about true crime, or I want to write a book that's about um, a ballerina. <laughs> and then you set about doing that, it doesn't work out, and you just like, you know, I give up. You know, that's the end of that. And then I thought, but, but, but that's not the way to get what you really want from life. It's not the way to achieve, be productive and have a, a life that you enjoy, because what might actually satisfy you, make you happy, might be something other than what you set out to do. So redefine what you think of as a door, the door to your path to success, the door to the goal that you want. It could be that you wanted to write about a ballerina, but as it happened, you get to write a magazine article about a construction worker. But one thing leads to another, and the path is usually windy, you know, and you might find that you like construction workers better than ballerinas. You never know. <laughs> so I guess it's just about being open to all possibilities and keeping your mind open to what could actually be satisfying to you career-wise. And of course, that's true personally too. Yeah, um, great advice. Wow. I feel yeah. like if we were in live in person now, we should have you guys do a mic drop or right. something. <laughs> okay, here we are. <clears throat> so we are here to talk about The Fall Girl, amongst other things, which is Marsha's most recent novel. It just came out in September. It's a standalone novel, and it has the characters Charlie and Erica. So it's told from two points of view. They're both women. Charlie is a character that was on the defense side, right? Right. And Erica is a prosecutor in the DA's office. Charlie has some bad things happen in her life, and she has to move from Chicago to Santa Cruz and ends up joining Erica and becoming a prosecutor in the DA's office as well. Did I get that all right? Yeah. Okay. And, <laughs> <very> I, <laughs> and I found that character of Charlie, I don't think I've ever read a character that's been on both sides of the table like that in a novel. Can you talk about how you came up with that idea and what it brought to your writing because you could have a character that looked at things from both sides. 
Well, that came from my own life because I started as a defense attorney, criminal defense work in private practice, and then went into the DA's office, which is the opposite of what most people do. I do everything backwards. <laughs> so most people start in prosecutor's office or the public defender where you get a lot of experience in trial, and then they go out into private practice and make more money. I decided that I would make less money and <laughs> went into the DA's office, and I was there for 14 years. And now I'm back out in private practice doing court-appointed work for indigent criminal defendants um, doing their appeals, direct appeals. So uh, that's kind of my perspective. And I found that it really does give you a very different view of criminal law, of the defendants, of the witnesses, of the whole system, when you've been on both sides as much as I've been on both sides. You have a chance to really see the weaknesses and the strengths in each one. And I think it gives you an ability to stand back and see things more objectively, maybe, and it may be more balanced way. It also really made me think that it should be something that maybe is required, that anyone who starts out in criminal defense should be required to be a prosecutor for a couple of years and vice versa, to give a more balanced view of the system and, uh, and the needs of both sides. Charlie came from that experience. But I wanted Charlie to come into the prosecutor's office with much more of a chip on her shoulder than I did. So Charlie was a dyed-in-the-wool public defender, never going to work for the man. I had felt that way myself for the four or five years I was in criminal defense until I decided I really wasn't that gung-ho and moved to the prosecutor's office. But Charlie never was going to do anything other than defend until a tragedy happened in her life for which she blamed herself and then um, wound up losing everyone close to her in terms of connection because of her guilt, because they blamed her. Um, And so she decided to drop the identity and move to a small town, the smallest one she could find. And she thought she could do without any more Chicago winters. So she (laughs) wanted to move to California. So when she came to California with a new identity and everything, she also brought with her a heavy suspicion about prosecutors. She didn't necessarily like the idea of working for them, with them, but she developed a taste for it. She certainly did find, yeah, I can do some good here too. This is okay. But then wound up, um, because she had that mindset of being suspicious, was suspicious of Erica, to whom she is assigned as the second chair on a very big high profile murder case and is constantly looking over Erica's shoulder. Erica knows it and thinks Charlie's got something to hide too. So you have the two of them looking askance at one another throughout the story. That worked really well too in the audio book version, having the dual narrators, the the two voices made that come alive for me as opposed to having just one narrator. So that's one of the questions we have for you is, is what was it like recording your own book? I'm so glad it worked for you. Um, <laughs> I wrote this book, I, I, you know, I really, because... I wrote this book with the idea of I want the device of alternating chapters. You know, one's Charlie, one's Erica, Charlie, Erica, just because I'd never done that before. And I thought I'm going to write them also Charlie in the first person, Erica in the third person to give the reader a different feeling chapter to chapter. And then when I sold the book to the audio company and they asked me to narrate it, I had never narrated my fiction work before. And I was pretty nervous about it. But most of all, I thought, well, I can do this, but if I don't have someone else doing the alternating chapters doing Erica, then you're not going to get the full impact of the device. I didn't know who to tap for that. They said, I don't know. You know, I I suggested to them that we have someone else. And they said, well, who? And then I thought, you know, my writing partner, my TV writing partner, she's been in so many writer's rooms. She's had to do a lot of line readings. She knows how to deliver on a line like nobody's business. I thought she'd be perfect if she'll do it. I begged her. She said, I'll try. So she and I did a sample recording for the company. They said, okay, that works. And we did it. And it was really cool. So I'm so glad that it worked. And I'm glad that you you liked having the two different voices. That's really nice to hear. Yeah, absolutely. The only thing I didn't like is leaving Chicago because I'm a native of the city, you know. <laughs> um, so I was excited. I was like, oh, it's in in Chicago. And John burst my bubble really quickly. He's like, yeah, that doesn't last. You know, it's not really. But anyway, I'm teasing. I'm joking. I'm sorry. You know what? (laughs) Truly, I picked Chicago to begin with because I love Chicago. I think it's a fabulous city. Every single chance I got to visit there, I had such a good time. I'd go back in a heartbeat. So that's her origin because I love Chicago. Yeah. And I had to have a reason for her not to. 
So I picked the winter. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And that, that definitely worked. Um, you know, some of the other things, um, I, I took some notes when I was listening, which that's the only drawback for audiobooks is, you know, it's hard to take notes about things. But I think being from both sides, working with juries, that must be really fascinating on how you present to juries. There was one scene where I think it was Charlie was talking about how jurors feel safer when they think that they can tell who a murderer is just by looking at the person. We know that serial killers, you know, there's the classic stereotype that they're all handsome and very good with the ladies. And so I was just wondering if you could talk a little bit about that as maybe a lawyer and then as a writer representing what it's like to work with the jury. Some of it is guesswork. I mean, I've spoken to my fair share of jurors after trials. Um, it's debatable how honest they feel they can be with us. I always wanted to tell them, just say what you really think. I just want to know what you're really thinking and what worked for you and what didn't work for you. And to a certain extent, I'm sure I got some real information, but they're nice people. So <laughs> they probably didn't want to say anything mean to me. That said, though, what you can learn in questioning jurors when you select a jury I always say, you don't really select a jury, it's deselection. Mm -hmm. I don't get to go out in the street and say, I like you, 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 <laughs> I don't get to do that. So the jurors get brought in and I get to excuse those who I think might not be able to handle the case as well. So it's deselection. And in the course of talking to them, you can sometimes get a sense of what they expect to see in terms of a defendant who has committed murder. And it never failed to surprise them. I don't know if in today's juries it would necessarily be so. They're all much more savvy with the Internet, with so much true crime that's being depicted on television and streaming all over the place now. But still, that's kind of those cases that you see on TV tend to be man bites dog. You know, those are the ones that are outrageous. The more typical cases are the ones you really don't see on television. And so I would say to the jurors, do you think you know what a murderer looks like? And they would say no, but it was always kind of a no, yes, you know. <laughs> and so you think that they're going to look either very hard-faced or very tough or very bitter or very angry or, you know, something like that. And I would venture to say, and I would put big money on this, at some point in your life, you sat next to a murderer on a bus, on a train, in the theater, you know, it's just going to happen because people kill people. And it's not necessarily first degree premeditated murder, but it could be a vehicular homicide. It could be so many different things. And invariably, they would, no way, that's like no way that ever happened again. And so I don't want you to look at the defendant, but I do want you to think of one thing. You don't know what a murderer looks like. Could you accept that? Could you believe that? And after having the conversation with them about you've probably been walking next to one on the way to the courthouse, they go, OK, no, I, maybe I don't. They don't like it. No one likes it. You know, no one wants to believe that. But once you get them thinking along that line, you start to break down the bias that they may have about what a defendant should act like or look like if he's committed murder. And conversely, from the defense side as well, you know, my guy may look like he's lived rough and he has lived rough. That doesn't mean he is rough. It doesn't mean he would commit murder. It doesn't mean, you know, both sides of this coin are true. So the most important thing, I think, when you're picking a jury and when I think about it as a writer, you think about disabusing the jurors of bias, what they might expect to see, because it very seldom is what they do see. Can I ask a question? Please. So Chris and Emily are sitting together in a recording studio and you both look a little bit more reserved and nervous. I'm just wondering if you're rethinking anything. <laughs> I've always wondered about Chris. You know, she has those Chicago roots. She grew up in Cicero. <laughs> yeah, well, innocent, you know, small girl Ohio here. You never know. <laughs> it's so true, though. I mean, I always, I, I always thought of it from the perspective of a mother, too. Like, what would I do if one of my kids accidentally killed somebody? You read about those things, too. So I really appreciate how you framed it, that, you know, people can be murderers, not just because they're a serial killer. They can accidentally murder somebody, too. You know, interesting and very creepy, Marsha. Well, it's, you know, and it's accidental <laughs> that it's not murder. It's just a homicide. Right. But I have to right. say, you remind me of this moment. I was in um, San Francisco. My oldest son lives there and he was driving me somewhere. He had to drive Miss Daisy because I don't have a car up there. So, <laughs> and it was late at night. We were coming home from somewhere 
And this kid goes zooming out into the road on his skateboard. And mm. my son, like lightning reflex, stopped a swerve and totally missed the kid. And he's like, oh my God, life-changing moment. Can you imagine, mom? I can't even believe, I can't even think about what it would be like if I had hit him. Oh my God, imagine that. So mm-hmm. yeah, imagine how what, what a life-changing event it is for someone who's a good person and is just in that horrible situation. That's something yeah, I think about moments like that, that are life-changing that you have no control over. This this kid just went zooming out on his skateboard. Not my son's fault, right? but yeah. nevertheless, his life would be forever altered. Who knows how someone comes through who has a conscience, who has empathy, someone, someone that you would want to be friends with who suffered through something like that. They would suffer enormously, even though it's accidental. So that brings me to actually the fall girl. In the fall girl, I wanted to get much more into the psychology of what it's like to be involved in murder cases, what it's like to do something wrong, what it's like to be involved in something that goes horribly, fatally wrong, even if it's not really your fault, or maybe it's only partially your fault. When good people get involved in bad things, what happens to them psychologically? How does it play out? So for Erica, who already is a very damaged person in terms of her personal life, which no one knows, she hides it very well, very successful, but it definitely plays out in her life in a way that is really damaging. Charlie as well had these damaging, horrible trauma happened to her. It impacts the way she acts. It impacts everything she does. And I wanted to explore how the repercussions flow from the bad thing that they have been through. They're good people, but they were through bad things. And I think the impact on people who are fundamentally good can be much more interesting because they get twisted in ways that are different than someone who is, say, your typical sociopath, serial killer. I I don't know why, but I think I got tired of serial killers a long time ago (laughs) because- (laughs) You know, we see them all the time. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. And especially with the, the true crime, the popularity. And I think it is. It is fascinating to think about what would the average good person do in those situations. And so I think that's what makes the story so appealing. Yeah. It's one of the things that I found really interesting about it. And I had written down here in my notes, mental health in mm-hmm. general. It's on so many l- levels in this book. You have Mia, who's had some really tragic things happen in her own family very close to home. And what happens to a child when changes occur in their family life and they have little to no control over it? Same with Erica. She got placed in a foster home with a dad that painted a really happy picture and there was a lot going on behind the scenes that wasn't happy. And then Charlie, who had a really good life and something bad happened to her and she has to deal with the consequences of really trying to self-destruct in a certain way, right? So did you, I'm not quite sure how to phrase this question, but I mean, obviously as a lawyer, when you confront these things all the time, you bring your own history to the table. How do you do that without, I mean, obviously Erica in this story and Charlie are both really struggling. Is that something that you saw was common when you were in the DA's office? Or no, the public not program. necessarily. <laughs> no. <laughs> well, but, you know, but I think here's the thing. Um, I wouldn't necessarily see it. And no one saw it in Erica, for example. You know, Erica mm, presents yeah. completely pulled together. She's super um, successful. She's somebody who she, you know, like, you know, a win-loss record that is amazing. And she seems to be, have it all together underneath, not so much. And that's the thing that is, to me, so interesting. If people present a certain way, that doesn't mean that that's what they are, right? Seldom is what they are. What's underneath can be completely different. And Charlie as well. She presents in public as being really pulled together and pretty solid on her feet, when in fact she's borderline alcoholic. She's doing Xanax. She's having to, because she's constantly tamping down all these feelings of regret and blame and shame and you know misery. So she medicates her feelings away for quite some time until she realizes she can't achieve what she needs to until she gets herself clean. So that's a struggle that she goes through. Erica, on the other hand, um, really begins to unravel and decompensate because she doesn't know how to deal with what she has done. So I guess it's my way of speculating what lies beneath with people who seem to be so pulled together and so cool and so strong and all that. So I would say, I'm sure there were prosecutors or defense attorneys that I was hanging around with that were not as pulled together as they seem. I'm sure they weren't, but 
that's the fun of being a writer is to speculate. <laughs> yeah. Right. Yeah. So speaking of writing, one of the questions we enjoy asking writers is about their writing process. And when Emily and I were talking earlier today, we were talking about just how disciplined lawyers have to be when they're putting a case together and how that involves creativity as well, we imagine. Mm -hmm. And so we were wondering about the similarities between being a lawyer putting together a case and then being a novelist putting together a plot and a story and, and character development. Could you talk a little bit about your process and if there are similarities to being a lawyer? Yeah, I mean, <laughs> I have to say, I think Publishers Weekly said it best when I came out with the first novel, Clark turns to fiction to control the outcome. <laughs> so, <laughs> so I was going to say, you know, it's really more fun being a writer because I can't, you know, oh God, I don't have enough evidence. That seems pretty weak. Backspace, backspace, backspace. <laughs> Fingerprints were found. <laughs> yeah, they were found. And you know, as a lawyer, you don't get to do that no matter how tempted you may be. Yes. <laughs> as a lawyer, you have to deal with what you've got. Now that said, you do want to put it together in a way that is the most coherent and maybe the most dramatic as you can. And you also schedule witnesses so that at the end of every day, you try to end on a witness who's going to have something powerful to send the jury home with. Think about, you try to set it up that way. However, I love when people talk about lawyering at trial work, you're the director of the film. No, you're not. You're not the director. You know who the director is? That guy in the black robe sitting up there who can say overruled, sustained, or shut up. <laughs> so you don't get to run your own ship. You get to ask the questions. You hope to get the answers you want. You may not get them. And you certainly can't control how often they're going to object on the other side of counsel table. And you definitely can't predict how the judge is going to rule. So you have to be willing and ready to roll with the punches. Every time you get an objection and you get a ruling, you have to regroup, figure out how to get back to square three or four, wherever you were hoping to be, and keep going and find the way to get the evidence in that you need. In some respects, it's similar then in the broad strokes of things, but in the specific, it can be very different. Mm. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Writing your own outcomes. I love that. <laughs> <laughs> it is really more fun. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> And there's a, we'll drop a little, we'd really, we talked earlier, like no spoilers. We don't want to spoil, but there's a little bit of that in this book too, where the lawyers might try to do some of that, you know, <laughs> making their own outcomes. That's all we're going to say about that one. A little bit, a little bit. John, I think you, you, you threaded that needle the best I've ever seen with the hints that you gave without really giving them. I thought I really should memorize what you wrote. <laughs> oh, so, I, so, so I was listening to Emily say that and I'm thinking, did I give it all away? <laughs> <laughs> no, you gave away just enough. And I'm like, I gave away the game. I don't know. <laughs> I always screw it up every single time. I either tell everything or else I go, I can't talk. <laughs> it's very short interview. <laughs> It's so sad. Um, I'm here to say, read the book and get back to me. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, we'll talk. Well, one of the things I really enjoyed about the book, too, is there are, even though, you know, it's about murder and mayhem, there were some fun little, um, fun little, what's the way to one say? One-liners. One yeah. And one of them I wrote down is when you were describing Mia's boyfriend, Axel, you said, Axel was where chivalry went to die. <laughs> <laughs> I just love that line. I was like, I know those people. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so Charlie has these moments of observation. Mia is, um, it's not giving anything away to say, Mia is their defendant. She's charged with killing her mother, stabbing her to death in a frenzy killing. And she maintains her innocence throughout. And it happens on a night after she had been to this big party. She goes home and she claims she finds her mother dead, Erica and Skip see the evidence and go, no, you killed her. <laughs> you didn't find her dead. You made her dead. And then they have to interview the, all the um, kids at the party. You know, there was because her mother and her had a big fight on the phone that night when she was at the party. So one by one, they talk to these kids. These are not big scenes, but they're just enough to give you a sense of the kind of crowd Mia was running around in. It was a typical teenage crowd with some that are nicer than others, but a couple of the ones that they talk to are really pretty self-involved, jerky teens, which they have, that happens. Yeah. Um, 
And so Charlie has her own observations about, wow, nice friends you got, you know? And <laughs> so. <laughs> yes, very yeah. good. Well, Marsha, I feel like we could talk to you all night, but we can't do that because you we have can't. other things to do. But, but we do want to ask a final question about what are you working on next in the world of books? I'm not supposed to talk about this yet. So I do have another project in the works and I'm working on that. I also am working on uh, producing podcasts with a podcast company and also, of course, handling casework. So busy. <laughs> Lots of stuff going on. <laughs> Hopefully right. next time I see you, I can talk about the book. Yeah, well, we'll keep our ears out and... We got a line with John, we know. So. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. I'm I'm kind of hoping. I know this is a standalone, but maybe we'll see Charlie and Erica again. <laughs> it knows? could happen. You never know. <laughs> I think we need to clone Marsha. One Marsha for books, one Marsha for podcasts, one for TV, <laughs> one for law. Yeah. Now, do you mind? Can I ask Marsha one more question that I sure. actually think might bring this whole conversation full circle? Possibly. Please. Set up and then I'll swing and I'll miss. <laughs> but <laughs> I wanted to ask you if you wouldn't mind speaking about Kathy Lepard for a moment because she is your co-narrator uh, on the audiobook and it's so fun to hear you both do it and it's nice to hear Marsha Clark's voice because it's something that's familiar. It's almost like having a friend you know tell you a story <laughs> which I kind of love even though I know you don't like to hear yourself speak. Nor do I contrary to popular opinion but my question is you know in bringing it back to finding, you know, sort of the courage and the fortitude to forge new paths. If I remember correctly, Kathy was actually the person way back when, probably in the early 2000s, who got you writing for TV. And then that really got you thinking about maybe I can write a novel. So would you talk about that progression and how, I guess, doing this audiobook with Kathy is kind of its own full circle moment in a way? Yeah, you're right. It was really interesting. I had thought about writing a novel after I finished the book on the trial. I loved my collaborator. Teresa Carpenter is a brilliant writer and a wonderful person. And I had a great time with her. I just loved her work. And after we finished the book on the trial, I said, you know what? Let's write fiction. I want to write crime fiction. And she goes, no, you write crime fiction. You can do this. Go do this. And I gave up. <laughs> I said, no, I can't. So I didn't. And then by accident, a TV writer asked me to meet with them for lunch to give legal advice on a script to consult. And I did. And then she said, my friend has a, a show going up on Lifetime. They're going to need a legal consultant. It's based on the DA's office in Los Angeles. You might know something about that. <laughs> and so she hired me. I wound up being a consultant on the show. We wound up writing scripts together, which was so much fun. I loved it. Kathy is a, an amazing writer. She's one of these very rare birds who can write comedy as well as drama and action as well as romance as well. She can just write it. She can do it all. She's fantastic. So we wound up writing together after the show went down. We wound up selling pilots around town for a while. And then when I got a show up at ABC, I brought her on and she wrote on The Fix. And we've been friends ever since. So she is a fabulous writer and she has been in comedy rooms. Like she was on the John Larroquette show. She was on Blossom. And in a writer's room where it's a, a sitcom, often the writer's assistant has to be able to say the line so that the writers could hear it. And she was a kid when she started. And so he would have to give a comedic reading. And if the line didn't sound good, they would have to keep working. So if she wanted to go home that night, she had to make the line sound really great. <laughs> she got really good at it. She was amazing, has fantastic timing, which is why full circle, when it came to having to pick somebody to do the co-narrating with me for the book, I thought couldn't find anyone better. And thus it was. <laughs> That's great. That's great. Well, in kind of full circle on your advice at the beginning of our conversation of just go through those doors that open and see where you end up. And now you're a full-fledged fiction writer. So there you go. There you go. That's it. great. Yeah. <laughs> Some people accuse me of that when I was a prosecutor, but never mind. <laughs> <laughs> Another mic drop. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Oh, gosh. Well, Marsha, uh, thank you so much for yeah. taking the time to be with us this evening. Really a pleasure. So nice to meet you. John speaks so highly of you and, you know, is such a fan guy. So nice. I, I love John so much. He's a dear, dear friend. And I, ho I hope he does fire him after this. Yeah. <laughs> John. Oh, more than satisfactory, Marsha. <laughs> 
<laughs> and thank you guys so much for having me on. What a pleasure. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks for listening to The Book Cougars with Chris Wallach and Emily Fine. We'll be back again in two weeks with another episode. Until then, come chat with us on social media. If you'd like to become a Patreon supporter, we would love to have you join our community. All of the books that we talked about in this episode are listed in the show notes, which you can find at bookcougars.com. Each book will link to our bookshop.org page where your purchase will help support not only the book cougars, but also independent bookstores everywhere. And if you're an audiobook listener, we do have a special offer from libro.fm. You can find all of this information on our website. Again, that's bookcougars.com. Thanks, everybody. This episode is edited by Pat Keo Sound Design.